Welcome to Dreamland. This is a pre-recorded, previously broadcast program. ...in the human experience, not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. And yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. Good evening, everybody. It's Sunday evening. Welcome to another Dreamland. I'm Art Bell, and there's a bunch of news to catch you up on and a couple of programming notes, and we'll launch as usual with Linda Howe uh, this evening, parked in Denver, Colorado. First, though, I would like to welcome to uh, the Dreamland group KTUC-AM in Tucson, Arizona. KTUC, one of the regular affiliates on the uh, syndicated program, now joining Dreamland. Welcome, Tucson. And uh, the person who had most to do with that, I guess, Mike Gabrielson, who is the program director at KTUC. Good to be in Tucson now with uh, Dreamland. Also, WAIV-FM, the station manager there, Richard Parker in Peru, Illinois. So, Richard, thank you for getting us on in Peru, Illinois. Welcome to those two affiliates. Now totaling 75 as uh, Dreamland. And uh, uh, some animal mutilations uh, that have been occurring in, now in eastern Colorado, making news there again. Um, that state has uh, had animal mutilations reported since uh, the late 1960s, and uh, recently there have been four animals reported to the El Paso and Elbert County Sheriff's Office in Colorado two counties that had literally hundreds of animal mutilations between the 60s and the 80s. And um, uh, another interesting piece of news while this is going on in Colorado is that the Anchorage uh, Daily newspaper reported on August 29th that 3,000 caribou in the Alaska Peninsula near the community of uh, King Salmon have disappeared and that wildlife biologists with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game are puzzled. Even many of the caribou had radio collars for scientists to track. The newspaper reported that where game experts expected to find a healthy herd of 15,000 to 20,000 caribou this summer, they can find only 12,000. At least 3,000 animals, possibly more, are either dead or missing. The Ken Pitcher, the regional wildlife supervisor, was quoted as saying, quote, We just got kind of smacked between the eyes with this sudden and inexplicable decline. We're just kind of struggling with what is going on here. A fish and game veterinarian was involved in helping with the radio coloring, and he detected no obvious signs of disease among any of the animals handled by biologists. And he said, quote, It's really one of those puzzling things. It's a little more mysterious than a, uh, they had a, uh, what they think was a also sudden disappearance of the herd a few years ago that was uh, never fully explained. So that falls in the category, again, of missing animals. And then on September 13th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, an eyewitness in New Mexico, north of Las Vegas, New Mexico, reported to the local sheriff that he had found a dead and mutilated cow there was another dead cow nearby that was not cut, and most astonishing of all, a cow was moving across the pasture on its side with its back moving toward an unusual sound coming from a canyon near the pasture. Moving on its side, Linda? Moving on its side. By itself? Well, there was nothing. I mean, this was the astonishing part of this eyewitness account, and you're going to hear this in a moment. He is... He's, he's standing there near the mutilated animal and a dead animal nearby, and suddenly one of the cows in the pasture is just comes into his view, moving toward and, and with simultaneously with a very odd and loud, intense sound that is coming from a nearby canyon. And he has a out 6 rifle uh, because he's out hunting, as you will hear him explain. He's out hunting some berry as a out 6 and he ends up trying to shoot at the sound uh, and this stops uh, the animal moving, but it is still a very strange story, as you will hear as I play this excerpt. All right. Wow. And then he went up into the mountain. Too long because I was hunting there. I was walking through the uh, through the canyon, 
and it's about two, I'd say half a mile away from the from the house. And when I came upon my car, and I saw it thing, they had that hole, and it kind of freaked me out. And it kept on getting closer. I saw another car, but it didn't have a hole. It didn't didn't have the the mouth, you know, mutilated or anything. And I was just looking at it, and all of a sudden, I heard that noise. And uh, can you describe? Can you describe the noise as best you can? The noise to me sounded. I've heard it before. Or you know, when I very first came here, it was the middle of the day, about two o'clock in the evening, two or three. But it didn't phase me. You know, I didn't think about it. And uh, I just ignored it. I looked out, and I looked up toward the canyon, but it was the same area. It was like uh, the opposite area from the area where I had seen that cow. And, uh, I, think I heard that noise, you know, when I really got here about a month or two months ago. And I didn't pay attention. I thought it was somebody working, an arc welder or somebody working. But it sounds like an arc weld sound. It goes... Or something like that. Mm-hmm. But it, it, to me, it sounded like a night well. And that's what the first thing that came into my mind in those few seconds, you know, it just came into my mind about that noise. And all at the same time, everything like happened so quick, you know. I mean, when I heard that noise, then all of a sudden I heard the cows that I had passed. I was up the canyon, I had passed those cows. There's quite a few cows. And I looked back because I heard the running of the, the, the steps. And I turned around and I saw them all running the opposite direction. So when I turned, those few seconds I turned back to look at the to hear, you know, or to look toward the, where that sound was coming from. And as soon as I saw that, I seen this cow that was at the other side of the bench. And when I saw it being pulled, it was on, on the other side of the bench, but it was being pulled right through the top of the brush or right through, like, through the brush. And I would see the cow at a good maybe 50 feet being drugged and then making a uh, oh, oh it wasn't like it was like a, an animal that was being tortured or or being uh, how can I say uh, explain it uh, it wasn't uh, like a regular you know mowing of a cow you know and it was like an animal being tortured yeah it sounded like uh, like if it was being hurt or or it was hurt or like it was being tortured or something. Bellowing. Yeah. And now, to get this clear, when you say it's being dragged, do you mean that it's floating off the ground or it's being dragged on the ground? And it's being like just a... Uh, it wasn't... It was being dragged, not in the air. Cause the, the cow was able to, to touch the ground with its feet. But sideways, the cow was going sideways. Okay, now when you say sideways, do you mean that it's back? What was it? The back was going towards the, the, the sound. And? The right part of the cow. Okay. It was to get up, but it couldn't get up. Okay, now what you mean is it's literally lying on the ground moving yeah. sideways. Right. Now, did you see tracks on the ground where that animal had been dragged? There was no tracks. And at that point, he lifted up his .30-06 rifle, he said maybe out of instinct, and shot at the sound, or shot toward the sound, and the sound stopped and the animal stopped moving. Wow. And at that point, this man was uh, upset. And he turned around and he said you know, he had one thing on his mind was to get other people out there to take a look at the situation and to call the sheriff. And he ran back to a trailer where he was camped, made the phone calls. He said it took him about 15 minutes to get to the trailer, made the call to the sheriff and to the other people, ran back, and maybe 30 minutes max had uh, elapsed. And when he got back there, he couldn't believe his eyes that the cow that had been being dragged toward the sound and the other animal that he thought was dead but not cut were gone. They were not there anywhere and the only animal in the pasture was the first mutilated animal that he came across um, to make this even more mysterious is that when some of uh, the sheriffs and, and these other people got to the scene they all looked 
the signs of the animal that was being dragged and, and for the uh, signs of the other animal and for signs of struggle. And the ground was damp from a, a recent rain, but as uh, this eyewitness said, it was so strange to him because he had watched this with his own eyes, but they couldn't find evidence of this. It was as if uh, somebody had come along and, and uh, vacuumed the grass or something the way uh, he put it because there should have been some tracks there. Um, we have gotten uh, tissue from uh, the, uh, the animal that was behind and some other uh, material that we're going to investigate. And in the weeks ahead, I will try to uh, continue to update this story. Uh, and for me, particularly, after 15 years of trying to find out what is happening in the animal mutilation mystery and constantly running into what appears to be at least circumstantial links to something non-human, the sound of things like turbines or helicopters or, as he's describing here, this uh, welder's arc torch zoom sound have been reported in the past and things have not been seen in the air. And then there are the people who have reported seeing animals going up in beams of light with no sound. Uh, any way you cut it, this is an eyewitness report of something that happened recently that does fall into the category of these unusual animal deaths over the last 30-some years. All right, you talk to the man, Linda. Yeah. Um, how would you judge his credibility? Well, he is a uh, humble carpenter. Uh, he does not want uh, any, uh, he doesn't want anybody to, to come and, you know, and, where he is, he's, he's not... Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to be on hard copy. He, he does not want to do anything. Uh, uh, this, this is his most, you know, an anonymous eyewitness report, which is valid because the newspapers in New Mexico did uh, report this story. Mm -hmm. um, but this is no, he doesn't have anything to gain. Uh, he very honestly uh, reported it to the sheriff's office and reported it to other people because he was so astonished. And uh, further, I have had a veterinarian go and examine the animal. And there is, uh, from the standpoint of the vet, the jaw was stripped clean in an unusual fashion, as has been reported in all mm -hmm. the unusual deaths. Uh, and he thought that in and around the jaw area uh, that there was sign of, of a high heat. So, again, this is a, a very puzzling uh, story, but it is consistent with the high strangeness that's been reported in these events in the past. All right. Well, there's that incident. And uh, uh, then we've got the stuff going on in New Mexico. And now you're talking about Colorado. I have a question for you, Linda. Right. Um, as we look out over the years of the kinds of things that you investigate, there have been intense periods of activity. Are we in one of those now? Yes, I would say that uh, 1989 was uh, at the beginning of what seems like a cycle again where it was uh, reported uh, many dozens and dozens of cases in Idaho and other places. And then as we got into the 90s, uh, there were more mutilations being reported from Canada through more scattered parts of the United States. Last year, the whole northeastern Alabama story was uh, so filled with lights, with strange helicopters, with strange sounds of helicopters and with mutilations and people videotaping these odd moving lights that you had everything that's been reported over the last 35 years concentrated in Alabama. But it also included South Dakota and Canada and England and uh, Scandinavian countries and Germany, uh, France, in the past two or three years. And now this year, it has been, in some ways, we've had some of the highest strangeness uh, mutilation cases because... Uh, Dr. John Altshuler and I are working on this research grant. We're able to work with more veterinarians and pathology labs, and I have tried to report some of the very interesting cases like the Las Vegas and the continuing saga in northern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And in these cases where we've had strange, unexplained excisions of skull bone, for example, with no uh, known way that this could have happened, especially when there was no excision on the outside of the head, um, these kinds of high strangeness cases have definitely been a part of this year as much as any time. And now we've got uh, an eyewitness to a cow literally moving on its side across the pasture toward uh, a very intense sound coming from a canyon but with nothing visible. And these are the, uh, 
this is what makes this phenomenon so hard to investigate because there are pieces of it that a lot of people say, well, it just can't be true. But it's been going on for 35 years, and uh, how it will continue to evolve for the rest of this year is what I'm going to try to keep up with because there are mutilations that are being reported uh, in a variety of places, not with the intensity of New Mexico and Colorado, in other places currently, but it is not confined just to the West. Well, I know uh, that you had planned to be home this weekend, this Sunday, and you are not because right. it's, it's continuing to go on. So That's right. off you go on more adventure. What about next Sunday? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Wherever I am, I will try to give you an updated report on the Colorado situation. All right. Boy, what a report. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Wonderful. Talk to you next Sunday. That is Linda Howe. And she's on the move. Uh, this is one of those periods of time of high activity, apparently. And she's on the move throughout the U.S. West. And you just heard fascinating, absolutely fascinating stuff. Dr. Richard Boylan, a practicing clinical and research psychologist, specializing in cases of apparent abductions of humans by aliens, has just published a new book that is rocking the usual placid world of ufology. Why all the fuss? Well, until now, the predominant view of alien abductions has been that they are traumatic affairs that cause people great psychological harm. Not so, says Dr. Boylan. By applying his professional expertise to the more than 100 cases of apparent alien abduction, Dr. Boylan concludes that alien abductions may not be a bad thing for most people. In fact, he's found that 59% of the experiencers achieve a positive attitude toward the encounters after a brief adjustment period. That's almost 6 out of 10. In every case studied, persons who exhibited severe trauma related to UFO events were also found to have experienced human-induced trauma that preceded the abduction experience. Reliving the trauma of the alien abduction through hypnosis triggered the release of earlier traumatic memories. Hypnotists and researchers who are not professionally trained to make such subtle distinctions are quite likely to confuse the trauma from previous human-induced experiences with the trauma from the abduction and consequently uh, reach unsupportable conclusions about the true nature of alien abductions and their effects on humans. In a moment... We'll connect with Dr. Boylan, taking an exam. Uh, Dr. Boylan, are you there? Oh, yes, Art. Hi, and hello to all our listeners out there. It's, uh, it's good to have you back. We interviewed you, I think, long ago, didn't we, in Area 2000? When uh, we were doing that program? Uh, I think uh, that may have, yeah, well, it happened. Uh, uh, we're certainly happy to be back and uh, certainly have some... Uh, updated findings to share with everybody. All right. Very briefly, because we've got about a minute, uh, give us a little bit of your background, Doctor. Well, I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, and uh, I also do research and some consulting. I've uh, got a master's in uh, education, a master's in social work, and a PhD in psychology. Uh, these degrees are from Fordham and UC Berkeley and UC Davis. Uh, I've been a former county mental health director. I've been a mm -hmm. psychotherapist for 23 years. Uh, my interest in UFOs stems from 1947 as a little tyke, uh, eight years old, when uh, Kenneth Arnold saw his disc over, uh, over uh, Mount Rainier, Washington State, and, and then the Roswell crash made the papers. Uh, I was a disappointed little tyke when uh, the... Uh, papers came out the next day and say it was, been said it was a weather balloon. By, by the way, and we're about at the bottom of the hour, did you believe the recent uh, we lied, here's the real truth, it was a balloon explanation? No, and I'll tell you briefly why. Uh, uh, all right, oh, good. Well, f fine, I want to hear that. Hold that explanation. We'll do it right after the break. Okay. And uh, so stay right there. Dr. Richard Boylan is my guest. Close Extraterrestrial Encounters, his book, More in a Moment. Continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. 
Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222 or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295 727-1295 in the 702 area code now again here's art bell now again here i am good evening everybody i'm art bell my guest is dr richard boylan dr boylan are you there doctor oh yes all right um, you you said um, that you do not believe the recent announcement by the Air Force um, regarding uh, what happened uh, uh, so long ago, back in 1947. Uh, why don't you believe it? Well, I've, I've got three reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, in 1947, the Army Air Corps Intelligence Office put out a news release on the uh, National Wire Service that they had captured a downed... Uh, extraterrestrial vehicle and uh, took the uh, vessel and its uh, dead occupants into custody. The next day they issued a retraction saying it was a uh, uh, it was a weather balloon with a, a radar uh, target uh, dangling from it that uh, mm -hmm. fighter pilots would use for target practice. Right. Well, uh, subsequent to that, uh, 47 years later, the Air Force a couple Fridays ago said that they lied the last 47 years that it wasn't a balloon with a radar tar target dangling from the bottom of it it was a balloon with a uh, high altitude uh, particle sniffer hanging from the bottom of it to detect uh, if the Russians uh, had recently set off a nuclear weapons test That's now right. there's two problems with that well three actually the first one is that several years ago uh, Air Force General Bose uh, went public and said that we we concocted the uh, the weather balloon story to cover up the fact that we uh, we had to get that disc and those dead bodies out of there. We need to buy time. We didn't want everybody crawling all over the place, so we put out the weather balloon story. The second problem with it is um, that, uh, as I understand, the Russians uh, did not begin uh, atomic bomb testing until 1949, so it didn't make much sense to be. Uh, sending up a detector for test in 1947. The, uh, the third reason is that I have been told by a Central Intelligence Agency agent in Sacramento who also carries Office of Naval Investigation credentials that I've seen personally for myself, who told me that there were two crashes in uh, New Mexico. One, indeed, the Roswell saucer, which they retrieved, and, and the dead occupants inside, extraterrestrials. And another one farther to the west in New Mexico, where, again, uh, the military uh, special unit uh, retrieved the, uh, the downed UFO and its occupants. Only one of them was alive, and this the extraterrestrial was taken into custody and detained and lived for several years. So those are the three reasons why I don't think the Air Force uh, balloon hoax number two is any uh, better of an explanation than Air Force balloon hoax number one was. Why then, uh, if they, if you look at it from their point of view, Doctor, it's kind of strange that they would bother midway in this giant cover-up, you know, to um, sort of admit lying and then, and then concoct another very similar story I mean, why even go through all that? Why not just uh, let time take care of things and stick with your original story? Why, why bother? Why bother with all this extra stuff? And especially with such a uh, pathetic story that most eighth graders could develop a better cover-up cover story than that. Exactly. Okay, I, I think there's two things going on here. Uh, one of which is that uh, the. Um, Government Accounting Office, the Congressional Investigating Body, is is That's hot true. on the trail of Roswell. As you know, Congressman Schiff ordered a, uh, a study to uh, retrieve the documents from the various agencies on the Roswell saucer retrieval, or as he put it more delicately, just what exactly happened at Roswell. Mm -hmm. 
I have uh, written to my senator, Senator Feinstein in California, and she has graciously uh, responded and uh, joined Congressman Schiff in oh. ordering uh, the GAO investigation, uh, requesting it, I guess would be the correct phrasing. By the way, Doctor, where does it go from here? Does it now close down because of their explanation? Oh, 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 oh no, 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 let me uh, pursue this. So now we've got two, and, and I understand there's a third congressperson going to join this. Uh, the GAO, I, I have uh, gotten, uh, Senator Feinstein was kind enough to uh, send a report from the national, uh, in an international security expert for the, the government uh, accounting office saying that he is now getting full cooperation from the agencies involved. Mm -hmm. And I understand from a usually well-informed source that uh, they've gotten nine feet of documents from a Department of Defense documents catch in the Midwest related to this and are now pouring through those. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so uh, there's, there's pressure because the, uh, the the truth is going to come out on Roswell uh, if anybody still needs to be convinced. The second thing is that I think what is going on here is an extremely sophisticated disinformation psychological warfare project. And, uh, and here's what I mean by that. If If you were in the shoes of the cover-up folks in the, in, the, in the government on the UFO matter, and if you knew that forces were at work, as they are with the GAO and so forth, and all these uh, witnesses to Roswell, whose depositions have been taken by this Washington, D.C. law firm and all ready to go the minute Congress holds hearings, and people are working on having Congress hold those hearings, if you knew that all this uh, excrement was in the fan, so to speak, and it's all going to come tumbling out, then uh, how, how do you uh, do damage control? Well, one of the things you can do is, first of all, get people used to the idea that the government has been lying to them about UFOs. And this silly dispatch they put out a couple Fridays ago uh, conditions people by saying, we lied for the last 47 years, but here, here's a better version of uh, what actually happened. <laughs> yes. Number two, by putting such an absurd, uh, almost identical, false explanation for the uh, the saucer retrieval and the and the dead extraterrestrial body retrievals uh, out, they are to the uh, average person beginning to make it very clear that not only has the government lied, but the government has not been uh, doing a very good job of covering up this with believable alternatives, and it's sort of like the story of how you boil a frog. You just increase the water temperature one degree at a time, and by the time you reach boiling point, the frog doesn't care because what's one more degree? Yeah. And uh, so the American people, by the time this comes out, they're used to, A, the government's been lying to them, and B, that uh, there's pathetic stories that, that you shouldn't believe, and everybody kind of knows that the government's been covering up this anyway so that it's more likely to be a big yawn when the final shoe drops. Well, I don't know about a big yawn. I mean, if, if, the, end, if the final truth uh, was we lied, they were aliens, I'm not sure that's a yawn. Well, you know, the Gallup polls and other polls have indicated that about half or a little better than half the American population believe UFOs are real. And I think if you push the same folks another notch, they'd say the people who are piloting them are real. And if you push them another notch, I would imagine the majority of those would say there's certainly a strong likelihood that some of those craft have come down and landed on the ground. So uh, I, I go around the, the uh, country uh, speaking to people, uh, not only at con UFO conferences, but in shopping malls, you know, as, as I talk about my, my book of bread. And uh, I'm, I'm hitting a cross-section of America. And I want to tell you, people are not grabbing their hearts and falling over with heart attacks when, when they get some evidence that UFOs are real. They, everybody kind of knows. You may remember, Art, uh, a couple of years ago in the New Yorker, there was this wonderful cartoon that showed uh, this couple in their bedroom. And the man is being hauled off by four extraterrestrials uh, out the door. And his wife, who's really kind of nonchalant about the whole thing is, is sitting up in bed uh, you know, looking at the TV and, and her only question to him as he's being hauled off by the four ETs is uh, do you want me to take Murphy Brown uh, for you so, when you so you can see it when you get back <laughs> you know uh, in other words to, 
to get that cartoon, the American yeah. people have to be so used to the the game plan, the uh, the drill of how ET uh, encounters go. That you know, a group shows up, they take you out the bedroom, you're gone about an hour, and you come back. That they would get that cartoon as, as and get the point behind it. No, well, you're a psychologist. You're suggesting we are being conditioned. Oh, you, 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 uh, let me put it uh, a little starkly. Uh, yes. Uh, here's here's as stark as I can put it. The UFO cover-up is the largest, single, and longest-lasting uh, psychological warfare project in the history of the world. It is the most money's been spent on it, and it has been directed at the uh, internally at the American public by its own uh, governmental agencies. Mm. Well, that's stark enough. Listen, uh, before we leave Roswell, which we will, you said there was a second crash. What can you tell us about that? Uh, not a whole lot. This individual did not go into more detail. Uh, I, I kind of put two and two together with what uh, uh, Randall and Schmidt and uh, uh, Stan Friedman have been researching about rumors of a second craft that went down more or less on, on the plains of San Augustine near Day 2, where we now have the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, the largest complex of uh, radio uh, deep space listening dishes uh, in the world and sending dishes, that's another story mm -hmm. um, uh, and that uh, there are conflicting uh, reports about uh, said the craft uh, but there uh, are some indications that people uh, saw some activity out that way uh, all I'm saying is that this uh, CIA uh, official who had uh, nothing to gain by pumping uh, additional data in my head, uh, uh, volunteered this up when he was trying to uh, uh, infiltrate into my uh, research group. Infiltrate? Well, he wanted to attend meetings uh, that were designed for people who had ET experiences and he didn't have one, and uh, uh, I, I would imagine he was doing it on Uncle Sam's time. Uh-huh. Uh, fascinating. All right. You've written a book called Close Extraterrestrial Encounters. You've researched, what, about 100 uh, Well, 130 cases, cases now, plus 130. I'm, I'm, 131 is going to walk in this week. Uh, um, and these are ones I've talked to at length, not just quick uh, phone calls or uh, quarter conversations. But uh, Well, uh, you're, you're a very bright guy with very uh, impressive credentials, and so my question, I think, is meaningful. Through all this research, uh, this is sort of a, a cover statement. Have you concluded absolutely, without question, in your own mind, this is real, we are being visited, they are here, or have been here, or are coming? Uh, what have you concluded? Well, uh, to answer that, we have to go to a couple of levels. Uh, I, I'm using in my research the uh, the traditional approaches of the behavioral and social sciences, which uh, are to gather a number of, of cases and look for statistical patterns in them uh, that and the causes for those uh, uh, results. And uh, uh, this is inductive research for the technical-minded among you. Uh, and. Uh, Obviously, screening people for psychological normalcy. I, I've had some hoaxers come in, uh, very few. I've had some people who are psychologically unbalanced come in, very few. I've had a few who, in my opinion, were sent by uh, military intelligence or intelligence agencies anyway, who uh, were trying to sell me a bill of goods uh, that was uh, palpably false. Uh, disinformation. Uh, Doctor, I'm curious. It would be very, very important for you uh, to weed out the hoaxers uh, r right at the very beginning, or at least during the process, yeah. so that you don't end up like a couple of other recent researchers uh, with egg on your face when somebody later comes back and says, guess what? I made it all up. You know the story of John Mack. Yeah, and the Donna Bassett uh, infiltration. I I've had a couple of those folks who... Uh, who uh, did that. Um, um, How do you weed them out? Uh, over time, they, they expose themselves. Some are obvious. Uh, you know, I, I've been at uh, psychological counseling for 23 years, and uh, I can pretty well spot uh, people who are uh, not 
in, in you know, uh, good contact with reality uh, or, or seem overly driven with an exotic agenda that doesn't line up with known facts. Mm -hmm. um, in a few cases, people can, uh, who, uh, you know, have some other problems going on in their life can, uh, can uh, pass a uh, ET experience on and uh, be somewhat uh, hard to detect for a while because it's hard to tell whether the oddness is coming from the other experiences in their life or from their ET experience. But soon enough they trip themselves up because their, their accounts don't line up with what we are now getting to be a fairly clear profile of how ET contacts go. Uh, they make up just the wrong kinds of... Uh, uh, little details and elements, and uh, uh, they kind of give themselves the way that their story is of human manufacture and not of uh, actual experience. Of my uh, research sample, if we may say, uh, I would, I was, last time I took a, uh, a uh, measurement, 89% of the folks were psychologically sound, normal, upstanding people. Uh, mm -hmm. They include people like a uh, Republican political figure, a... Uh, um, uh, a business person, uh, somebody who works for the phone company, a housewife, uh, 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 artist, uh, uh, state workers, uh, and, and people from all cross-sections of life, uh, media journalists, former intelligence officers, former military officers. Um, do you know, I, I've, got, I've got to do this. Um, yeah. Uh, the Republican political figure, you, you, you can't give us a name, can you? Uh, well, no. I, uh, people I had saw ask. me as a professional psychologist and my like confidentiality rules. Uh, well, I understand. I'm sorry, I had to ask. Yeah, yeah well, uh, I, I do not mean he was elected to office, but he uh, very closely works with uh, political affairs to uh, make certain, uh, mm, shall we say, political uh, uh, initiatives and, and measures uh, move forward with success towards their conclusion. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, that's probably vague enough for to be safe. <laughs> um, so uh, all, all cross-sections of life, people who've got everything to lose and nothing to gain from telling the, the false stories, first of all, they're coming to a psychologist. Some of them have expressed, and all of them probably hold in their heart the fear that... Uh, uh, you know, I might just slip a butterfly net over him and haul him off to the mental hospital for telling such tall tales, but uh, uh, they ne nevertheless courageously tell it as it is. Uh, while we're on that subject, uh, that that's very interesting, uh, Doctor. I want to ask you this. Number one, uh, what percentage of your colleagues do you think would have somebody perhaps hauled off uh, for telling such a story? Well... Uh, that's that, that's hard to say. Uh, I have some in inkling from some of the people I've talked to, for whom I was not the first mental health professional they talked to. In in I would say eight or nine cases at least out of the 130 people that talked to another psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever, uh, and got the raised eyebrow or uh, got mm -hmm. this fancy explanation about how uh, they were distorting something that there was actually some trauma of childhood that their mind has twisted around or is just a dream or or real nervousness and shifting in the chair to where this person got so upset by the uncomfortableness of the therapist that they shut right down and changed the subject. Uh, they didn't want to push it any farther. Uh, maybe they felt the next step was going to be the butterfly net. Exactly so. Doctor, I got a letter this week from a physician back in the Midwest, and I won't go into any more detail than that, but he was concerned, came to me, wrote to me, because he has now had three people come to him with these experiences, and uh, he's just a regular doctor, physician, and yeah. doesn't, doesn't know what to do. So yeah. I thought I would ask you, uh, what should he do? Okay, well, uh, I would suggest he, he uh, buy the, my book, and, and the, uh, the reason for that is one of the chapters was designed to be especially aimed at uh, therapists, and uh, certain doctors kind of fit in that uh, model, you know, particularly in rural areas where it's not easy to get at a therapist. Uh, chapter 16, Special Counseling for Experiences, talks about kind of a... a an approach that any uh, uh, good professionally trained uh, medical uh, person can probably use with some beneficial help. I also want to let him and all the others out there know that uh, 
uh, we've just formed a uh, an association for therapists who work with people who've had close extraterrestrial encounters. It's called the Academy of Clinical Close Encounter Therapists. It has been uh, recognized by the state of California and the federal government as a nonprofit educational organization. Uh, Leo Sprinkle, uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, the uh, president. Dr. Ronnie Kilde, uh, acting surgeon general of. Uh, uh, Finland is uh, is uh, vice president. I'm the secretary mm-hmm. treasurer. We have another couple of therapists on the board of directors, and uh, we have people therapists starting to pour in their application forms. The point of this is to pull together all of these professionals who are sitting out there: psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health uh, specialists, hypnotherapists, social workers, physicians, and others who. Uh, are sitting in isolation in, in towns and villages around this country and indeed around the world, scratching their heads, puzzled because this patient comes in and after they trust him, looks around kind of furtively and says, Doc, you probably won't believe this, but uh, <laughs> last night there was this you know individual standing in the corner of my room and all the place was lit up and, and I, I went out through the window and the window didn't even bother to open. Mm-hmm. You know, the ET and I went right out to the closed window pane glass and on and on, you know, one of these typical uh, accounts. Uh, all of these poor uh, therapists and medical uh, professionals sitting out here in isolation, we need to come together, be there for each other, pool all the information we're getting uh, in in one place, and uh, develop and advance the uh, art of, of how to uh, rapidly and briefly uh, debrief and, and uh uh, help people move rapidly through the strangeness and the scariness and the unusualness that they experience to a place of suddenness and uh, and and resolveness. All right, Doctor, we've about got it. we've got to hold it there. Uh, we're yeah. at the top of the hour. Stay right there. We'll be back to you. Doctor Richard Boyle is my guest. More in a moment. Broadcast program. 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 8255. First time callers, area code 702 727 1222. Or the wildcard line at 702 727 1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. It is Sunday evening means dreamland. My guest is Dr. Richard J. Boylan, PhD clinical psychologist and author of Close Extraterrestrial Encounters. And that is indeed what we're talking about. We'll get back to him in just a moment. Now to Dr. Richard Boylan. And, uh, Doctor, are you there? Yes, indeed. Good. Um, Of all these uh, 130 now cases that you've studied, uh, is there any case that you would like to take the time to relate to us, you know, to give us some details on one that you find particularly intriguing? Uh, sure, and I think I'll stick with one uh, from uh, one of the people who have chosen to go public in the book so that uh, they, they already understand that it's okay to talk about their case. Uh, uh, one that really uh, kind of strikes me is a uh, fellow uh, who uh, was a uh, very typical kind of a, a, a kid uh, uh, living in a... Uh, rural area, uh, and uh, one day he uh, was outside, uh, there was a kind of a cloud blowing up, and he thought maybe a windstorm or a rainstorm was going to, to happen. Uh, uh, his uh, mother uh, 
called him to come out and see the beautiful clouds. His brother and his, his two brothers and his father were in front of the TV set uh, and uh, didn't choose to move and come out there. But he went out with mother to uh, see uh, the sky. And uh, then uh, uh, things began to get very strange and different. Uh, wind began to swirl. Uh, their dog began to act very erratic. Uh, and he noticed a lead-colored cylinder coming down out of the cloud. Uh, his mother became frantic at this and, and called him to come back to her. Uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, of course, being a curious little boy, looked at looking and looking at the cylinder. His, he, you know, his mother had a look of dread on her. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, the... Uh, and it came down very close to the ground, and there were four beings which uh, floated up a long hill towards his mother and him. Mm. Uh, his mother turned to him in a utter state of fright and screamed for him to run and, and began to ran herself. Uh, but the beings closed in on her, and, uh, uh, and she uh, kind of froze up and... Uh, and uh, floated her off behind uh, their garage. Uh, uh, he looked to the left and saw a kind of praying mantis uh, type uh, extraterrestrial figure headed towards him with a long head, uh, uh, a moderate torso, long skinny limbs, long fingers, thin, uh, and a gentle appearance with that kind of characteristic crook to the uh, elbow and, and the uh, arms and wrists and the legs. That make people think of sort of the, the kind of stick figure-ish uh, plain, praying mantis insect, although they're clearly talking about a, a humanoid extraterrestrial here and not an insect. Mm. Uh, and uh, he uh, put his head in at the corner of the house and uh, wet his pants. He was so scared mm -hmm. that the uh, praying mantis uh, extraterrestrial grabbed his arm and uh, suddenly he felt no longer afraid. Um, the beam left him, uh, led him across their yard and uh, down the hill to the spaceship, which was had a, had a lead gray appearance. And uh, they got inside the craft and uh, then uh, were put on a metal table and, and, and so forth. Uh, it was a kind of examination with a long white metal tube used as a kind of scanning device right across its body. Uh, some other procedures, uh, and after this, he was uh, there was a, a injection of some liquid put into his spine, uh, and then uh, a couple other beings came into this uh, internal room in the uh, UFO. Uh, they were seated at a bunch of controls. He could see out. Uh, his yard outside the window of this craft. Uh, they then took out a, a book and and told him this was the book of truth that he had known its contents but had forgotten it. It looked like a bunch of uh, kind of Chinese type uh, letters uh, he couldn't understand and very wiggly uh, uh, lines of text and. Uh, but the, somehow the idea about what the book had to say burst into his head, even though he obviously didn't know how to read this language, and he got that it was about the contents, about the need and the, the laws of balance in the universe, the love of all living things, dangers coming for the earth, and, and coming changes, uh, and so forth. Uh, mm. And he, he was then told that uh, when he reached 33 years of age, which was a long way off for a grade school age boy, that uh, he would have a greater understanding of events and that for now he uh, need not uh, bother to consciously uh, remember this experience. Uh, he uh, uh, was told a sort of a parting message from the extraterrestrials. They took this book of uh, instruction or book of truth and, and turned it over and there's a bright orange symbol that looked like uh, a sun except it's uh, 
raise your arms of, of fire if you were coming off the central circle of this uh, sun-like symbol, uh, rotated in a uh, to uh, in a direction uh, uh, to the left, I believe. And he was told you should remember this symbol. And uh, then um, uh, placed a uh, root. Uh, a tool placed in his ear and uh, squeezed and, and he got a stomach reaction like some sort of energy of balance had been shifted in his body and, and then he was uh, left out of the craft and uh, uh, out in the fields and, uh, and, and he went home uh, when he got in there his, his entire family including his mother were proceeding from the television set and even though many hours had gone by since uh, since the uh, the incident, uh, uh, his mother asked him if he had had fun playing the woods, and he said yes. And everybody acted as though nothing had happened, even though uh, he was uh, late for dinner and uh, uh, had an unexplained absence. Uh, when he uh, got done coming out of this experience, all that he consciously remembered as a child was these kind of uh, kind of trash canny looking kinds of metallic vehicles coming out of this turbulent sky and clouds and then uh, walking home late for dinner uh, when uh, we got together uh, and uh, uh, used uh, some hypnosis to remove the block of what happened in between then the rest of the details of this story came tumbling out. Wow. Uh, how old is this man now? He is uh, in his uh, mid to late 30s. And uh, what occurred to him at 33? Anything? On his 33rd birthday, uh, nothing happened, but during that uh, during that year, he began to have uh, dreams of flying through space and reunions with aliens that had visited him when he was 11. And uh, he got a distinct message that he should go, here's where it gets real interesting, go to the mountains and there would be some answers to his questions. Uh, he felt the dream was intriguing, but a little silly to drive around in the mountains wait for something to happen. So he called his older brother, who uh, uh, he'd always been close to, and the older brother told him he had had uh, uh, the same kind of dream, identical dream, mm -hmm. the same night. And so uh, it was the same idea that he should go driving in the mountains and he would know, know where to go and that something uh, important would happen. So these two brothers kind of uh, embarrassed to uh, uh, admit to each other that, that they felt a strong impulse to act on this message. So they got in the car and went up uh, into the northern uh, Sierra foothills uh, 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 in Northern California, uh, out of uh, Grass Valley, uh, and uh, worked at some of the uh, national forest roads, dirt roads up there. And every time they came to a turn, they they kind of instinctively knew which which fork they should take. And uh, it was, sometimes it would be one brother, and sometimes another, that they turn here, but the other one would instantly agree with them. Uh, already had that feeling himself. They got to a ridge way up in the mountains with a view of the setting sun, mm -hmm. and they got out in the clearing and uh, uh, waited a while there while the sun went down, and uh, then there's some rustling in the bushes, and they were surrounded by a dozen deer all looking straight at us, and his brother, uh, who had had some previous ET experience, knew that he said they're here, and he he was referring to extraterrestrials. In other words, he didn't think those deer were deer. That's not usual deer behavior for a whole herd to come out and surround a couple of humans and keep stand still and stare at them. Absolutely not. And then uh, they, uh, after that, they went a little farther up in the clearing, and uh, uh, he got uh, in an open space, you know, between uh, a number of tall pine trees, and it, he began to lift his arms as though he had no control over it, and uh, his body started to float off the ground. Wow. And uh, his, he asked what was going on, and his brother said, you're being initiated. Uh, his brother had had previous ET contact. Uh, they were then 
be surrounded by some several beings of uh, four feet tall or slightly less size who are dressed in hooded black robes with uh, hoods mm-hmm. over their heads so that their faces were in the shadows. Um, they, they put their hands on his body and he immediately was lifted up to the tops of the trees and kind of rotated around up in the air in a kind of a giddy uh, ride, if you will. Uh, uh, this was a very straight-laced kind of guy. It's almost like the ETs were telling him, loosen up and uh, you know, kind of go with it. Wow. He was given some telepathic messages about their version of God, the One. He was told they're from a golden planet that's part of a confederation that oversees the spiritual conduct of the universe and that the Earth is in transition and that they're coming to bring us, the Earth, into a family of planets when our uh, gradually increased awareness of other intelligent life in the universe has come to a point that we can accept that. And then he was brought down to the ground and uh, the ETs went slipped back into the shadows and he and his brother got in their car and, and drove home. So then this is the testimony of not one, but three people? Well, uh, him and his brother. Uh, him and his brother, so two people. Yeah. Um, wow. I'm sure that you looked carefully at these two. Uh, yeah. How did you judge their credibility to be? Excellent. This, this fellow is... Uh, highly respected uh, inter- international businessman, uh, interestingly enough, uh, has uh, been over to uh, Europe and, and particularly Russia and is helping them make the transition to uh, democracy and uh, setting up a, a uh, free enterprise as opposed to a communist form of economic uh, right. uh, structure if, since he has some background in that, uh, has seen his destiny as helping uh, Russia, it's sort of like his mission to bring the world community together, his little contribution, and, and it feels very distinctly that this is a direct spin-off of, of his uh, extraterrestrial encounters and, and the sense of mission that most experiencers seem to get. Doctor, uh, these messages uh, that the aliens seem to give, gave in, this, in the case of both brothers, seem to be almost godlike. Uh, that is to say, addressing us as a race, telling us what lies ahead, what troubles there may be, uh, what Earth needs to do. It's very godlike, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't, Art, uh, with all respect, uh, choose the phrase godlike. Uh, it is real parapsychological. Uh, you know, it, it, it suggests very strongly, and I've talked to a number of experiencers with similar accounts, including people. Uh, two or three at a time, you know, multiple witness cases. Uh, uh, and uh, it's very clear that, uh, first of all, the extraterrestrials are telepathic. Number two, that they have some ability at clairvoyance, mm-hmm. or perhaps they have some technical devices, maybe even time travel, but one way or the other can see into the future. However, it's a probable future. Nothing set in concrete. Uh, each of us has choices we make, and each choice we make changes the future in one direction or another. That uh, that they uh, have some ability. Obviously, a telekinesis can move things uh, that way. Uh, they have a number of abilities that some of the most advanced humans, uh, perhaps Zen monks or uh, uh, yoga practitioners or, or other. Uh, uh, practitioners of the mental arts or spiritual disciplines have developed but are rather rare among average humans uh, and that, that these are rather commonplace among them and they use these uh, for the purpose of uh, going around to different uh, planets, in, in this case Earth, that are at an earlier stage of development and helping them to make the transition uh, to the awkward stage we're at now where we're just bright enough to be dangerous to ourselves that we, we've stumbled on nuclear power uh, we, and space travel and uh, we now have instant global communications and extremely powerful uh, space-based weaponry we could uh, we could either move to the 21st century with with uh, an increasing uh, mental and, and spiritual and cultural development to match our, our high-tech hardware, or we could blow ourselves up. And they would like to see us advance uh, 
less materialistically, more with more mental and spiritual and uh, cultural development, more concerned for the planet's ecology, more concerned for each other, not letting wars of decimation go on, not letting uh, those kind of silent wars of mass famine going on, but, but come together as a people. They, they want to meet us, but they want to meet us as one human race, planet Earth, not a bunch of uh, warring duchies and dukedoms and, and uh, narrow, narrow-minded countries. Uh, they want to deal with us as Earthlings. Your message uh, to everybody in your book, and I guess whenever you talk on the subject, is that their visits here are either friendly or at, at minimum benign, not, uh, not threatening, not something to be frightened of. Uh, you stick by that? Yes, yes. It's, it's, uh, it's really clear to anybody who stops to think about it that if they were here for conquest, they, they could have done that a long time ago. And, and certainly on a military science uh, basis, it would have been smart for them to do it a long time ago. Uh, there is, in my view, substantial evidence going back into the archaeological record of extraterrestrial contact. Uh, I think many of your viewers are well aware of... Uh, of uh, a number of uh, uh, researchers and writers who've talked about evidence in you know primitive cave uh, paintings, uh, rock drawings by oh, yes. ancient people showing people wearing helmets, and uh, the ancient traditions of uh, Native Americans in this country, uh, particularly Hopi and Sioux, yes. Dakota Sioux traditions of star people coming down, the Aboriginals in uh, Australia having a similar tradition, and so forth around the world. Certainly the Mayan uh, a high culture uh, and, uh, of astronomy and, nu- and numeric sciences, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, it has a tradition of uh, space beings and space beings to come back and, and so forth. Um, so it, you're, you're... It's real clear that uh, if they wanted to wipe us out uh-huh. when we were still at the Stone Age, they could come in and, and dust us, and for that matter, they could do it today. Right, exactly. So your view, then, of their presence is one of uh, custodial care and watching over the uh, the human race? Well, not so much custodial. Uh, 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 what I'm touched by, by the extraterrestrials in the main, uh, there may be a few renegades here and there, but the vast, vast, vast majority of them are uh, cooperate in a uh, loosely confederated way have uh, have uh, uh, approached us with a, with a, a great deal of respect for our intelligence, for our uh, our free will, uh, for our right to develop uh, gradually. Uh, in the modern era, we've seen a, a a program of gradualistic exposure of their presence. Uh, in 1947, we started seeing some saucers. In the 50s, there were reports of uh, UFOs landing, people getting uh, extraterrestrials getting out walking around. In the 60s, we started having extraterrestrial contacts with humans, Betty and Barney Hill. All right, we're, we're at about a break point here, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the 70s, we started uh, having uh, close encounters. In the 80s, we have videotape of them, and now in the 90s, uh, all hell is breaking loose. We have flaps all over the place. Uh, right over Sacramento, where I am. But last night, there was a slow-moving green uh, light. With hold, hold, it, green hold, hold, doctor, hold it right there for a moment. Yeah. We'll be right back with Dr. Richard Boyle. This is a pre-recorded, previously broadcast program. It absolutely is. I'm Art Bell, and this is Dreamland on a Sunday evening. My guest is Dr. Richard Borland. He is a clinical psychologist with extensive credentials. His book, Close Extraterrestrial Encounters, Positive Experiences with Mysterious Visitors. And yes, we're about to get the telephone lines open, so if you want to begin lining up, that's just fine. Back to Dr. Richard Borlin. Doctor? Good evening, Art. Well, good evening again. And um, what I would like to do, if you're up for it, is open the telephone lines. It's not all that frequently these folks get a chance to talk to an expert with your qualifications. Yeah, well, that's just fine. So let us do that. Let's see what's out there. On the toll-free line, you are on the air with Dr. Boylan. Hi. Hello there. Yes. Yes, sir. You're on the air. Where are you calling from? Uh, San Diego. San Diego, okay. 
Uh, what is your uh, P.O. box in Peru? Um, it's Post Office Box 4755. 4755. Uh, that's right. And uh, the zip code? Uh, 89041. 89051. No, 41, sir. 41. 41. Yes. Okay. That's all I want. All right. Thank you very much for the call. On the uh, first-time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Boylan. Hello. Okay. Well, I'm on the air. Yes, you are. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes. I, I wanted to had a question for Art Bell. Uh, well, uh, I have a guest here, sir. Do you have yes. a question for my guest? Well, I just wanted to, re if you'd repeat that Friday night thing about the uh, new money and the and the Federal Reserve. All right, but not right now, sir. <laughs> Sorry about that, Dr. Boylan. They seem to have other things going here. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Boylan. Hello. Uh, hello, Art. This is Mark Palacito listening to you on um, KQMS. In Reading, yes. 1400 in Reading. Yes, sir. A question for, uh, is it Dr. Boylan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I noticed that uh, you had talked about some of your patients being in the, or clients being in the Grass Valley area. Well, uh, taking a ride up there, uh, um, I, I've had one of, uh, I don't want to indicate that most of the people I've talked to on this topic have been uh uh, therapy patients, uh, most of them have come in under my research project, which is a side effort uh, to uh, report their experiences and uh, let me uh, become more familiar with, with their story. Well, I, I guess the point I'm coming to is that you, you said there's been a lot of sightings in the Sacramento area. Yeah. And, uh, uh, of course, last year and the year before, there were a lot of sightings in the Clear Lake area and prior yes. to that, Off Point Arena. Well, I find it interesting that, that all these sightings seem to sort of uh, well, centrally located to a lot of those sightings, or at least along the same latitude as Beale Air Force Base, mm -hmm. where there has also been an awful lot of activity. Yeah. Uh, I've personally seen uh, vehicles that were uh, glowing, spherical-type uh, craft coming out of that general area within the past uh, four months. Now, are you talking about at night? Yes. And you say right around quarter of eleven and at night. What about their their glow or their illumination struck you as different than general military aircraft? Well, it was almost like an incandescent bulb floating in the sky rather than a, uh, a set of landing lights. And, and this was fairly large things that appeared to be about 50 feet in diameter. Now, you're talking about light fairly uniformly all the way around the outside skin of this vehicle. Yes, as though the entire skin was lit up. Yeah, or, or a plasma field just right off mm -hmm. the skin. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, similar and to what, what I've seen at Area 51 and, and at the Northrop Aerospace plant near Lancaster where the U.S. manufactures its own copycat saucers. I, I was up at a uh, National Forest Fire Lookout Station uh, with binoculars uh, up by Bowman Lake looking at Beale. Uh, oh, last... Uh, uh, must have been six months ago, uh, and I saw several lighted uh, vehicles in the sky hovering near Beale, lit up like Christmas tree uh, with uh, different colored lights, uh, and, and drifting ever so slowly up towards uh, those slightly uh, rising hills to the east of Beale's main uh, tarmac, uh, but hovering there mostly. Uh, uh, I don't know if this matches up to anything with what you saw. Uh, well, he's gone now, but it certainly sounds similar. Uh, yeah, the entire uh, vehicle lit up. Yeah, well, there, there's some very strange stuff going on. Beal, Beal is a, a, you know, a highly classified base. Uh, the cover story is that uh, you know, uh, they used to keep the Blackbird uh, SR-71 reconnaissance spy plane there before they sent them down to Holloman, and now they're they're going back and using the U-2s. Well, the, there are U-2s there, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There are strong indications from folks who have seen uh, activity there that uh, the Aurora, the, the plane that isn't supposed to exist, uh, is, is being uh, operated out of there. And uh, uh, there may be even more classified uh, material going on. There are persistent... Uh, uh, UFO sightings in the general area, and it may not be an accident that this uh, space surveillance base that, uh, uh, by way of uh, various technologies, pulls down information from the edge of, of space about what's going on 
uh, from that vantage point uh, is also a place of a lot of UFO sightings. All right, uh, let's keep moving. A lot of calls, Doctor. Uh, Toll-free line, you're on the air with Dr. Richard Boylan. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Uh, turn your radio off, number yeah. one, and number two, tell us where are you calling from? Uh, Seattle, Washington. Seattle. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, in the 7.30 hour, uh, Dr. Bowen, he asked Dr. Bowen a question, you know, I think, uh, are the aliens or the extraterrestrials uh, among us? And then he went into a long uh, explanation of, of what he's going to classify, but he never answered the question. So are they are they here now? Well, that, that was all right. That was kind of a composite uh, question. I was simply uh, uh, trying to ask you what you have concluded, Doctor. In other words, are they really here? And so let's get specific. Are yeah. they here among us on an everyday basis? Uh, all I can tell you is from my my research and uh, from uh, unimpeachable sources that I, I am in contact with. Um, that's, that's a little tricky question. There's no doubt that they are here making, in the sense that extraterrestrials are making physical and intense telepathic communication contacts with human beings every day in great numbers. My own personal estimate based on my work and Robert Durant's uh, uh, research and uh, the Roper poll, which I think it exaggerates the count. I've, I've broken it by a factor of four down, but Using the, uh, kind of a composite of those sources, I've estimated that there are 3,000 extraterrestrial contacts a day going on in the United States alone. Per day? Per day, and, and certainly uh, 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 the rest of the world is having its own fair share as well. Now, uh, in addition to, not all of these are physical showing up where a person is pulled to the side of the road and gets out of the car and meets an individual or somebody pops up in their bedroom. Uh, some of these are uh, mental contacts where uh, uh, intense amounts of information are dumped in their head uh, during uh, telepathic uh, communications, uh, often uh, during the, the night hours. Now, uh, in addition to this, there are extraterrestrials who uh, repeated reports uh, uh, use cloaking, or to put it more specifically, disguise their appearance by a kind of mind projection of a visualization of themselves as a rather ordinary looking human being so that when they walk by you, what you see is an ordinary fellow human being uh, dressed conventionally walking by you, but it's actually an extraterrestrial who is uh, convincing your mind that you're seeing a uh, human instead of the ET's actual uh, uh, more odd appearance. All right, well, I think that addresses the question. Uh, in the little poop sheet they sent along with your uh, book ad here, it says, the Secretary General of the UN has asked all nations to recognize the reality of UFOs. What did he say, and when did he say that? Well, the, uh, uh, I'm not familiar with that exact quote, uh, the, uh, the U the UN took a the General Assembly took a resolution some some years ago in the in the uh, late 70s that the uh, phenomena of UFOs appear to have enough reality basis that there should be an intense study of it, uh, and there's been a subsequent effort to get the UN to move ahead on that uh, since then. Uh, well, I'm sure that was it then. That, that sounds about right. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, cer certain people have talked, uh, highly placed individuals, I don't want to give away privileged conversations, but uh, n internationally famous UFO uh, researchers uh, that you, anybody would recognize instantly have talked with the UN uh, leadership, and it's pretty clear that they're aware of the ET phenomenon and are trying to, uh, in their own uh, way, uh, find a way to deal with it. All right, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Dr. Richard Boylan. Hello. Hi. Hi, where are you, sir? I'm in Phoenix. This Phoenix. Is Henry. Hello, Henry. In Phoenix. Uh, I, I wanted to ask our guest here, uh, is, is he convinced that they have considerable power to to influence and to, to even deceive uh, if they wish? and put over whatever information they want to on a telepathic or whatever manner to humanoids? All right. Um, yes. Uh, when, when Are they practicing to deceive, Doctor? Well, uh, 
I, w I would want to distinguish the two questions, whether they are influencing uh, individual humans and, and human uh, cultural evolution. Uh, yes, uh, in, in certainly uh, they say that they're doing that. Uh, individual experiences are experiencing it. Uh, they're being prompted to take up special projects that are serving the purpose of both bringing out the ET reality and moving ahead humanity towards uh, more peaceful and uh, cooperative, less violent uh, ways uh, and to getting the ET reality message out. Uh, uh, practicing to deceive um, in the sense of an unnecessary deception just to be uh, crooked or dishonest, uh, I, I have seen no evidence of that. If by deception we're saying that the ETs at time find it useful or necessary, for example, when they're visiting a small child to uh, create a visualization in the child's mind that, that, that the individual in their, in their bedroom is the Easter Bunny or Casper the Friendly Ghost uh, uh, or some such uh, or maybe even a familiar family figure uh, then uh, if they affect deception then they're doing that but it's well intended to reduce the shock or, the or, or, or doctor deception in order to cloak their uh, uh, the reality of their presence Yes, well, they, they certainly can do invisibility technology at both the, at the individual and at the, uh, at the craft level. In fact, that's part of what it bedevils our military, is that they have no defense against the extraterrestrials. The extraterrestrials can cross into any base. They can walk through uh, walls into a room. Uh, security means nothing to them. They can take on the appearance of a highly placed... Uh, uh, Air Force Colonel and walk in and everybody salutes them and uh, well then how, can... how could the military service then not regard them as a severe um, uh, national security threat they do indeed exactly that uh, they, uh, that is quite clear that uh, the national security uh, agency uh, successfully resisted a freedom of information uh, lawsuit uh, to divulge documents about, that they held about uh, ETs and UFOs, and they said that if we were to release these documents, this would constitute uh, extremely serious damage to the national security of the United States. And other, that's, that's code language for we, the steps above top secret. Mm -hmm. Well, when they closed Project Blue Book, I believe the statement was uh, these, whatever they are, pose no threat to national security. Well, they, they pose no threat to... Uh, the well-being of the United States in the sense that these are not hostile invaders. Uh, when, I, when we talk about national security, I was using it in the sense of uh, the military and intelligence establishment, uh, which is used to being in charge of, of the, in the running of the affairs of the United States and of the world, uh, being bested by a higher uh, uh, culture and technology that can run circles around them. Well, then, you thought, you, do you think their statement then meant uh, no threat to uh, the security of the social structure of the United States or the people of the, of the United States? Right. There is, there is no danger there. In fact, the gradualism, uh, the last 47 years, the ETs have very slowly and laboriously, gradually gotten us used to the idea that they're here, that they make contact. Uh, what they're what they're about, what they look like, what their communications are, that they're about ecological and and uh, social balance, uh, respect for uh, mm -hmm. uh, individual uh, uh, gradual understanding, uh, it, the friendly invitation of us to join the larger community of intelligent civilizations out there. If only we'd adopt a little better manners. Uh, uh, that, that, that is a, uh, a gradualism that shows a lot of respect for us. Uh, they're definitely not a conquering power, and, they, and they're not uh, arrogant in their superiority. All right. Uh, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Richard Boylan. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Art. This is Greg up in Mountain Home, Idaho. How are you doing? Uh, just fine. Um, I was just wondering, you know, now he's talking about these visitors as extraterrestrial, but... Um, how about if they were? What, what's his opinion as far as maybe transdimensional? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question, Doctor. Um, e extraterrestrial, transdimensional visitors from time. Uh, what's most likely, or is it a combination thereof? Well, 
I, use, I prefer the term extraterrestrial because we have the best evidence for that. Uh, the ETs have, have said that they're from other planets. They've shown a number of experiencers when either in mental communications where they find the individual in their car or their bedroom or wherever or, or on board craft, they've shown them their home planet. Uh, in one case, it's a golden looking place. In another place, a desert kind of planet. Mm -hmm. They've shown uh, their home star system. Uh, in one case, uh, one race said to one experiencer that we come from four light years away. Uh, that, that's certainly not the only place they're coming from. Uh, so it's pretty clear that the ETs see themselves as coming from different star systems. Now, I do not take particular issue with either the transdimensional nor the time travel explanations. I don't think those are alternative in the sense that they're, they're, you know, from our future or from our past, and, and that they're just earthlings that have evolved, uh, in, let's say, and come from the future. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, the ETs indicate that they come from other planet sources. Plus, now, uh, with, the get here, plus with the description you gave us, uh, there would be some pretty nifty tricks of evolution ahead. Uh. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, now, I, I think in getting here, uh, given the nature of space-time and uh, and the bending thereof to uh, make uh, ex extensive travel in any kind of reasonable time frame, it may literally be true that the time on the ET's home planet would be different than the time on planet Earth. That they may or be, from their point of view, either in our future or in our, our past from their home planet's time uh, and vice versa. Also, uh, I'm no expert on uh, quantum physics or astrophysics, but uh, the little bit I've, I've read, and uh, uh, particularly as applied to this, these issues, suggests that almost any substantial jump across space is going to require uh, sufficient uh, bending, of, uh, so to speak, of the space-time continuum to jump that, it's going to, that it's going to involve more than the standard four dimensions we're used to anyway. So uh, the short answer is I think the correct answer may well be all of the above, that they're extraterrestrial, that their time is not our time, and that to get here they had to jump dimensions. Oh, good. All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Dr. Richard Boylan. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Seattle, and yes, I've come into the program somewhat late, but uh, I thought I would call to amplify just a bit uh, what you're talking about there. I call because I am the relatively new director of the National UFO Reporting Hotline based in Seattle. Uh, I took over that position just about 30 days ago, and I just thought I would call to share with uh, you and with your listeners the fact that what has come over this hotline in the last 30 days or so is just nothing short of astonishing. And I speak as a relatively experienced ufologist. Uh, I have taken probably at least four calls in the last 30 days, point of fact, more like the last 15 days, from people who have had, it would appear, if we can believe what they say over the telephone, and in most cases I think we can, appear to have had personal interaction with either ships or beings. And uh, I think it's very important to share with the American, the, your listeners, the American people, the fact that something clearly is going on that our government is not even talking about. thought I'd just call to share that with you. Well, I appreciate it, and I'm sure you do too, uh, Doctor. It's really the same thing you're saying. Yeah, we've had flaps, and it's very interesting, like the Michigan flap over Lake Michigan near the, the shores of the state of Michigan. Oh, yes. You know, it, it was all over the Michigan papers, but I was up in Dayton, Ohio last weekend at, at a UFO conference and asked the audience there how many people heard about the Michigan flap, and Ohio touches borders with Michigan. Doctor, we've Almost got... nobody has heard of anything. Okay, Doctor, we've got a pause here. Every line is lit. Um, stay right where you are. We'll be right back. Dr. Richard Bowen. Boylan is my guest coming up on The Hour. Value life. Savings. Value 
line. Big savings. Value line. Save 50% and above on great products and more from a variety of Central Illinois businesses. But there's more. Oh, really? Value line is moved. What? That's right. Value line. Now six days a week. Listen, Monday.